when the word on the street is that you are a Christian, right? That generally means that you're that person that lives their faith publicly and as they would say out loud, meaning you're not treating your faith, your Christianity as if God and your Christianity is a mistress that you need to keep hidden from your real wife or your real husband or whatever it is that, or whoever it is that you're married to. But chances are, for those that are public about their faith in terms of their lifestyle and their expressions of love about God publicly, sometimes you're that person in the cafeteria sitting at the lunch table all by yourself because folks generally are trying to avoid you. You know, they, they don't want to hear about Jesus, you know, you know, you, it, I mean, even if it's sort of matter of factly that you bring up his name and, and a couple of, there's a couple of reasons why people tend to run away and shy away once they know that you're a Christian. One it would be that they know that they're not, or that they are perhaps living a lifestyle that they believe or know that God does not agree with. And if you're not saved, little do you know, God's more concerned about the person's heart because they can't live right, right? Unless God changes their heart and empowers them to make the right decisions in terms of how they do life. And so that's a big misunderstanding, first of all. You know, the second is ignorance, right? In that the belief is that if you're a Christian, that you, that, that you are anti-pleasure, you are anti-fun. God is not anti-pleasure and anti-fun. It become what our pleasures become a concern for God, and they should be for you if you are a believer, when they tend to lure you away from the will of God, when they lure you away from God, when your pleasures have, find a place in your heart where you have lost all conviction, where, whereas you want that more than you want the Lord. In fact, your pleasures are a problem when you find that they have caused you to backslide. And in this case, your pleasure is not a treat. It's not fun, but rather it is a trap. And what I say to that is, don't you go out like that. In a prior sermon, I referenced that there were roughly three things that I was going to cover, three things that I thought were essential warnings, things that we should pay close attention to as they would be used and can be used as tools to derail us. They can be used as traps against us. In part one of that message, I spoke about our hungers. And in this one, we're going to talk about our pleasures, but not just our pleasures, but also our proclivities. And so I don't have to define for you what a pleasure is, but I will define for you what a proclivity is or what pro proclivities are. And so when we speak of proclivities, it is our tendencies, right, to do something, re to choose to do something or to do something regularly. It's an inclination or it's a predisposition toward a particular thing. And some um, examples of proclivities that some of us struggle with would be anger. It would be lust, possibly, pride. And we, we named pleasure, but we're talking about the type, of course, that it is. Um, and what I often reference in my talks are those unworthy loves. And many of us have actually become prisoners of our proclivities in the sense that we now have uh, no longer choose what is right, 
But then also there's a side effect, right? A downside of the proclivity in which you now have tunnel vision, meaning that you see only that thing that you are after, only that thing that you are desire. Only that thing that you are predisposed to and nothing else, meaning everything around you, there's no peripheral vision. And as I said in the beginning with the word pleasure, that in and of itself is not a bad thing because it was created by God. Now, as far as the pleasures are concerned, it is forbidden by God if, once again, it serves to lead us away from his will. What is his will? It's also what is best for us. And when our pleasures or our proclivities, if you want to call it that, right, are not a reflection of God's will for us, then they too are forbidden. And when it comes to pleasures, there are pleasures that are actually rooted in lust. And lust, of course, is an evil desire, a craving or a longing and that desire for what I spoke about before for that which is forbidden. And James chapter one, and I'm going to read a little bit, 14, starting at four, verse 14 and, and then to ending at 15, it says each person is tempted when they are dragged or lured away by their own evil desire or in other words, lust, and then they are enticed. It says, then after the desire has conceived, in other words, after that person has acted on that desire, it then gives birth to sin. And then sin, when it has matured, produces death. It births death. Now, notice that the sin takes place when the person acts on that sin sinful desire or that impulse. I talk a lot about having terrible, poor impulse control and that lures many of us many times into to sin because we are acting on those impulses and once the sin takes place if you're really reading um james 1 and those verses that i read that once that sin takes place that that, that very act is going to lead to that person's death maybe not a physical death maybe a, a spiritual death but i really want to give you the greek meaning of that word that word death the, its greek meaning is the misery of the soul arising out of that sin and then it kind of goes on to talk about the fact that that misery right that consequence that death extends not only within the earth Right. But maybe even beyond. Right. If it's not repented of, so to speak. But the fact is, is that many of us, we don't really care about what goes on after life. And I don't think some of us even believe that that anything happens after we transition, so to speak, from this life to thereafter. But let's focus to right now on the death that occurs here. And so what we've just said is that the death refers to misery, you know, and yes, lust will end in misery, right? There are various kinds of lust. A lot of times when we think about it, we think about just um, those that are sexual and sensual. The Bible speaks about the lusts of the eye, right? Covetous, I believe, covetousness being one of them, right? But it speaks of the lusts of the flesh. And of course, it completes that thing that is in, in the earth that we all struggle with many times is also that pride of life. But I want to give you something powerful about pleasure because, you know, we all like to have fun and so forth. And we could all agree that when it comes to pleasure, whether it's forbidden or it's allowed, usually many times, you know, the pleasure only lasts as, as long as the act itself, right? And then we're pretty much ready for something else. Not so when it comes to the righteous pleasures of God that come from being in the presence of the Lord. Because it of the scriptures tell us that those righteous pleasures are forever more. But in terms of the earthly pleasures, like I said, it's usually short lived and only truly experienced during the act and the process of attaining that that pleasure. 
But what happens when a person, right, not only becomes this slave to their pleasures, but also a slave to their proclivities. And this is where their desires and their urges to behave a certain way drives them to act in defiance to the will of God. And so when whatever it is you're about drives you to act in defiance to the will of God, that's going to be your undoing. It's going to be your undoing. We may be in the driver's seat of making decisions about what it is that we are going to do and what pleasures and sins that we're going to commit. But what we are not in the driver's seat of is the consequences. And so this man that I'm about to talk to you about in scripture, to me, he embodies it all. A person that is in prison to his proclivities as well as imprisoned to his lusts. And we are talking about Samson and we will be in pretty much the book of Judges chapter 13 through pretty much chapter 16. And I won't read all of that, but I definitely encourage you to take some time and read that. Oh my goodness, it's a good read, but it's also a powerful read. And so a little bit about Samson. First of all, Samson was raised up and born during a very dark time in Israel's history. And it's interesting because his name actually means like the sun. And during that dark time in Israel's history, they were being oppressed by the Philistines. And God sent an angel who spoke to Samson's mother. And she ba he basically told her, who, by the way, at the time was barren, that she was going to have this son. And in Judges, I believe it, it starts around verse five of chapter three. She begins to reveal his purpose, Samson's purpose for his birth, as well as some instructions that she needed to follow. And they include this, that his head is never to be touched by a razor because he is a Nazarite which means that he was dedicated to God from the womb. And he was not, the, the angel didn't say that he would be a Nazarite only for a short period of time. And many Nazarites were Nazarites just for a, a, a specific period of time, not a lifetime like your, like John the Baptist was. And now Samson, it looks like in scripture since no timeline, you know, was given for his Nazarite devotion. But nonetheless, the, the angel spoke to her and basically said that a razor couldn't touch his head um, and that, that, that he needed to be dedicated to God from the womb. And so the idea was that Samson, when he became an adult, that he would serve as an example of commitment to God. And then he was supposed to take the lead in actually delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. And so what could he do? Right. Because because you'll hear me talk a lot sometimes about how God has gifted us. So and, and how he's gifted us is pretty much aligned sometimes with um, the purpose for which we were we were born. And so in 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 Samson's case, what was spoken to his mother, his mother also came in the form of his giftedness and his anointing. And some of the evidences of his anointing or the evidence of his anointing was this. He was anointed with strength, right? He was gifted. This this was clear. He was known. We, he is known still as kind of the strong man, you know, of, of the Bible or the strong man of those times. And he was unrivaled when it came to his spiritual strength. And some of the things that he did that proved his anointing of strength was were these. First of all, he killed a, a, a young lion that attacked him with his bare hands. That's in Judges chapter 14. He gathered 300 foxes or jackals and he tied them together. And then he, 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 he had torches they were tied together in pairs with torches sort of attached to their tails. And then they were sent through the grain fields of the Philistines 
And the idea was to destroy their livelihood, which was their crops. Um, a lot of us are familiar with the fact that he, he, he killed a thousand Philistine soldiers with the jawbone of a donkey. So I've just explained to you that this man was strong in physical strength. But what should be noted is he was weak when it came to his proclivities. So he was weakened by his proclivities. And what were some of those proclivities? What were some of those lusts even? First of all, Samson had a weakness for Philistine women. And you, you see a lot of that even going on today. Whereas a person can be so super anointed, even get so far as succeeding in building just an empire in terms of a church, a following and so forth and, and amass wealth and things. I have opinions about that, but that's not what this talk is about. But then in terms of their weaknesses, right, those weaknesses, the sins that are committed because of those weaknesses become their undoing. And so with Samson, he had a weakness for Philistine women. But also that you don't hear much about is that Samson also had a compulsion for vengeance, you know, or one of his proclivities was anger. And as a result of that, Samson was found always wanting to exact vengeance upon his en enemies. In fact, every victory or most victories that Samson affected or exacted over the Philistine, believe it or not, it was done out of a desire to get revenge and not so much any commitment whatsoever to obeying and following the will of God. It was about his anger. It was about him, him seeking revenge and justice for perhaps some wrong that was done to him. And so whenever he was physically strong, that that strength came from God, the spirit of God moving upon him. All right. And, and, and endowing him with that strength to kind of do those things. And even though Samson um, was spiritually and morally weak, God still used it because God still had a purpose to fulfill for his life. And scripture records him, and this is what is powerful about this. I said before that that strength was used often in the spirit of vengeance. And the fact is, is that God still used him, the gifting, the anointing, right, to destroy the Philistines and to loosen their hold of oppression, you know, over the Lord's people. But I want you to hear something about Samson, know something about him is that though he was gifted, he was not godly. In fact, Samson, if I get this right, in the book of Judges from 13 to 16, you only really seeing him praying two times, you know, and the once was after he had um, uh, obtained that victory over the thousand Philistine soldiers, meaning he had killed them. He was exhausted, you know, he had no energy and he was thirsty and he prayed to God, you know, in fact, he prayed, but not even in a humble way, but it was kind of, uh, it kind of went something like this, you know, you know, you basically brought me this far and you've used me to do all of this and to, to obtain the victory over them. But now will you let me die here, you know, a thirst. And the Bible says that the Lord gave him that water to energize him and to, um, to quench his thirst. And then the second time he prayed, it was right before his death, where he was asking God to avenge his eyes, which were actually gouged out by the Philistines because he revealed something that he should not have revealed. And that was um, the source of his strength, so to speak. And that was the fact that for, as part of his Nazarite commitment, and the, the vow that his mother's mother made, no razor would ever touch his head or should ever touch his head. And so we see here that as a result and the consequence of that, he lost that strength. The Philistines were then able to capture him, right? And his that's how his eyes was at, were actually gouged out and he was taken captive by him. And even though God used him in spite of himself, he yet was personally 
defeated. Here's the thing. I believe that that it was his proclivities, it was his pleasures, his lusts that blinded him. Remember I referenced earlier about that tunnel vision. You see, this man couldn't see past his pro proclivities, his pleasures. He actually had two wives, not one. Delilah, I believe, was the second wife. There was a first wife who also was attempting to deceive him to find out the secret to his strength because the Philistines could not, they didn't stand a chance with defeating him with all of this strength, this anointing of strength. So they needed to know what is giving him this strength. And, and, and they were willing to do anything to find out so that they can take this from him. They're those that will do anything. They get, sometimes they, it, it's not in a hostile way, right? It's in a friendly way. You know, it's in a sensual way. It's even in a sexual way sometimes. And in this case, it was through his wives that they would get, they're right close to this man's heart. Sometimes our biggest downfall occurs through the hands of those that are right next to our heart those loved ones, it was no different for Samson. And like I said, he had this weakness for Philistine women, right? Not God's necessarily his best choice, right, for him. And so the fact is, is that he never saw these Philistine wives. Like he knew that they were asking him questions and, and, and they were asking to know his secrets, but there was no discernment as to why this was so necessary for him to reveal to him. And he was pretty good with that first wife. And, and I, 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 before I could judge her too harshly, she was actually threatened by the Philistine leaders. You know, she was, they threatened to actually burn down, you know, their property and so forth. And so for her, she, she was act, acting under the duress, you know, of those threats when she attempted to deceive him. And right before he, Samson's victory of of slaying, you know, so many Philistines, it was all it was it was because um, his 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 wife had actually been given to another man, I believe his best man. So hence his his anger, you know, over that. Now. His second wife was Delilah and Delilah, the Bible speaks of him actually falling in love with her, I believe. And she was actually his undoing. And and I, I thought about this. I said, you know, it was clear that she he loved her, but I wonder if she loved him. And maybe if she did, there was something she loved more, right? And that more was the 1,100 pieces of silver each that the Philistines leaders had offered her in order to bring him down. And And I would say, if you were to ask me about her love for him, that to me would be a big fat no. But this love, an unworthy love, would actually be Samson's demise. And so when it comes to our proclivities, when it comes to our choices of pleasures, right, we have to look at what our inner compass, the condition of our inner compass. And so what was Samson's inner compass? What was the condition of it? Because depending on what is going on on the inside of us, right, it definitely inspires and guides and drives the choices that we make, right, outside in our outer life. You know, it, this truly is an inside out work. And so what we see definitely is evidence of something that's going inside, going on inside. And in Samson's case, his, you know, he, he, there was something off about his inner compass. Maybe his inner compass needed to be, you know, uh, recalibrated, as they say. And so what is an inner compass? An inner compass, compass is that which guides us in the direction of our moral and spiritual alignment. And the thing about that is for all of us that if we have not set Christ apart as Lord in our own hearts, it, which means to set him apart as Lord in our hearts means that he has first place and we we acknowledge him, which is why we also give him first place. We surrender all that we are, all that we even want. We surrender that over to the Lord because he has first place for us. He is Lord. He is Savior. He is my decision maker. Everything that I am, everything that I do, right, is done because of my commitment, my love 
for him or my lovelessness, right? Or my commitment to something else, right? Right. That determines our actions are, 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 are a reflection of what we're true, what, what our true loves and what we are truly committed to. And so he, he, the, he had not set Christ as Lord in his heart. And so therefore his inner compass was out of alignment and because his inner compass was out of alignment so were his pleasures and therefore when I, we are out of alignment our pleasures are always going to be unholy and they will always lead us right smack to the doorstep of the person place or thing that is going to be our undoing so my proclivity my pleasure may just be a trap and not a treat now what was the costliness of it all. Like when you think of this story, what was the costliness of it? Well, first of all, what did it cost the Philistines? Not much. I mean, I guess some would consider that relative, right? But it cost them about 1,100 pieces of silver each to hire Delilah, right? But to Samson, what did it cost? His disobedience made this once strong and powerful man a mockery and a laughing stock. I, I can't think of anything about that story that would make his decisions worth it. Moreover, his defeat was then used as entertainment for the Philistines. They actually even made a song about this. They sang about it. You ever wonder your enemy somewhere singing? We're up at night. Right. And after they have gotten a total victory and defeat over us by reducing us to the image of what they wanted us to become by seducing us into succumbing to whatever they're trying to convince us to do. Right. We're the ones suffering the consequences. We're the ones that are suffering sleepless nights. They're sleeping like a baby. And many of them have a song on their heart. They're dancing. They're celebrating because they have gotten the victory over you. And so they made a song about it. And then in the end, even though God graced him for that last time, so that at his death, he had killed more Philistines than in his entire life. Yes, God was able to accomplish some amazing things with Samson. But what did it cost him? It cost him everything. It, it rendered him a man who should have been honored, thought of highly, to have been reduced to only a fraction of the man that he was. And if you really think that this story was truly about Samson's hair, then you've missed it. This was really about his heart. You know, that inner compass is about one's condition of their heart. This wasn't about hair. It was about heart. And yes, that hair was tied to the Nazarite vow, right? But the fact that that was given away, the fact that that was exposed to someone, something that sensitive, something that held the keys to your anointing, right? To be given away is a result of the condition of his heart. I want you to think about that for just a second. And because of where his heart was, he did not protect that which was a symbol of consecration to God with reverential confidentiality. We can't tell everything. And sometimes a part of the reverence that you have for the things of God, you are careful who you reveal it to. And sometimes life and death, anointing or the loss of that anointing, may depend on you treating with confidential reverence what God has given and entrusted to you. Many of us are equally vulnerable because of this very thing, that we fail to protect our most valuable asset. Once again, not our hair, but this time our holiness. Do you protect your holiness. Oh, the holiness needs to be protected. The Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy. 
And when we don't protect our holiness, it is because, right, we gave it away, so to speak, right? And in so doing, we are reducing ourselves. We're not protecting our greatest asset. And when we don't protect our holiness, right, there is a loss of holiness. It will be our undoing, but it will also cast what I call a reproach, even sometimes on the name of the Lord. But it is certainly going to make you and I an object of laughter and disrespect. Protect your greatest asset. And your greatest asset isn't your house. It isn't your car. It isn't the designer clothes. It is not the empire that is set to build. It's not the church building. I call the church building a lot of times an aquarium and the people inside fish, right? But your most valuable asset is your holiness. It is your relationship with God. Even when it comes to the ministry, the ministry work, doing good things, being charitable, being a philanthropist, feeding the homeless, all of that is wonderful, but it is not your greatest asset. Your greatest asset is your love for God. Your greatest asset is your relationship with God. Your greatest asset is your holiness. But what I love is that this story didn't end quite like that. I mean, it ended, I mean, it ended and and everything that I said was true about Samson being defeated and so forth, personally defeated. But what I love is, is, is the grace of God, even in that, and even in spite of this man, having the issues that he had, the frailties that he had, the weaknesses that he had, we still see the grace of God. It reminds me of what Job said, I believe in chapter 42, where he he reminded us that no man can actually thwart the purposes of God. Remember what I said in the beginning that Samson was supposed to lead the effort in defeating and delivering Israel from the oppression of the Philistines. And even though Samson lost what I call this privilege of living a life that's that can be committed to loving and honoring and faithfully serving God, he did fall short of this. But you see God's grace being extended and God's purposes continuing to being fulfilled through Samson's final prayer. And that led to a bit of a plot twist, right? Because you see him now, I'm pretty sure that most watching him would have been convinced that this was over, right? Because he's now blind, he's now strengthless, you know, you know, he's 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 propped up against the, the he's being propped up against now the the pillars, you know, um where he was you know, it's over, right? It's it, it's done. The man is done. There's no more strength to be had. But you see God's grace in this in which he began to pray. And I want to share this prayer with you right by reading from the scriptures. It says, then Samson, this is Judges 16, 28 through 30. And it reads, then Samson called to the Lord saying, oh, Lord God, remember me, I pray. He said, strengthen me. I pray just this once that I may with one blow, he was asking for vengeance again, though, but okay, but with one blow, take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. Verse 29 says, and Samson took hold of the two, two middle pillars, which supported the temple. And he braced himself against them, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all of his might and the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it so that the dead that he killed at his death was more than he had killed in his entire life. Praise be to God. I see God's grace so powerfully. And you know what? Maybe this is a time that I pause and I say to someone Um, that you may feel like you've blown it and that you've wasted all of your life and there's nothing redeemable about it and God would not be interested. Even though Samson's prayer was selfish here, 
And even though he was a man that was imprisoned by his pleasures and his proclivities, which is why he he made the, the, the decisions that he made, and even making one very powerful, pricely, costly decision that was irreversible. That's how we can feel. That's what actually happened to him. God showed him grace. And God still made something redeemable, testifiable, celebratory about his life. And it says in the scriptures that he actually killed more Philistines in his death than his entire life. Yes, there was a loss. There's always a loss when we commit our lives to living outside the will of God. We miss out on the joys of experiencing him and knowing him. We go through undue suffering. We experience a belittling of the enemy sometimes that we have no idea is going on until it's too late, until the, till it, we get to a point in our lives where we look back and we are filled with regret over our life choices. But before you give up on yourself, remember Samson's last request, though, like I said, it was selfish. God still in that moment fulfilled his purpose, his plan was not thwarted. And I don't believe that the plan of God for your life, if you acknowledge the Lord that he is God, I don't believe that his plan for your life will be thwarted either. I just pray that early on, that right now, if you haven't already, that you repent that you you acknowledge, Lord, I, 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 I blew it, I was foolish, but Father, um, if you'll grant me time, or, or maybe you find that you're on your dying bed even, that God, even in my last moments, Father, redeem me, redeem something of my life. Maybe you're lying in a hospital bed, and maybe you're, that last thing that God will grant is that someone will witness something about you that will begin to minister to them. My point is, is that if you're still breathing, it's not over. And I don't believe that you have messed up so badly, right? That God doesn't want to hear from you. He does. And my, if, if he could do what he did with Samson, how much more will he do for somebody whose heart is turned towards God? And listen, it's true. I, I, I do agree that Samson didn't have to go out like that. And neither do you. But only God, only him, y'all, can turn messes, messes into messages, tests into testimonies, and the agony of defeat into the thrill of victory and the fulfillment of destiny. Glory be to God. So, Father, I pray in the name of Jesus, God, that he or she that receives this message would be encouraged that even if they feel that that so, so much has been a waste, that they drop to their knees now, say, Lord, whatever I have left, I give unto thee. And that they would know and sense, God, that you're listening, you will hear and you will do just that. You will grant the request. And you will begin, I believe, in some of our cases to restore the years that was lost and given to the wicked one, God. You will restore. And for some of us, God, within one week, one month, one year, two years, God, it will be as if there were 20, 30, 40 good years with you, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, I thank you. For every one father whose heart was melted and tenderized by this word in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, I thank you for every brother and every sister that hears this. You are not an outcast. If you can find it in your heart to call on the name of the Lord. If you can find it in your heart to receive him as Lord. If you can find it in your heart 
yes, to acknowledge, Lord, I too live for my pleasures, but Father, I want to live only for pleasing you. Oh yeah, that's music to God's ears and he will accept you into his beloved. And so I pray that this message inspires you and ministers to you. And I remind you as you read this story and you consider all the ways in which he went wrong, all the ways that he misused what God gave him, right? All the ways that he missed out on serving him and in and, 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 and the many ways that he just was not committed to the will of God, that you will declare to yourself, that will not be me. I will not go out like that. God bless you and keep you until next time. <music>